Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Mapledale, and let's begin with a word of prayer. Blessed Heavenly Father, Father, we look at the conditions around our world, and we look at things that are happening to people all over, and we wonder if it can get worse. And yet, Father, as we study the end of your book, the glorious revealing of your divine purpose, your divine truth, your divine will, what we discover is that for those who refuse to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, it not only can get worse, it will get worse. And Father, I pray in this church that you will break our hearts, that we will have no attitude within us of smugness, that we are going to enter one day your kingdom based on the completed work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, but rather, Father, that we would be a broken people. Regarding the fact that so many of the people in the earth refuse to turn to their only hope. And Father, that you would help us to be a people who love on others, who share the testimony of your work in our life, who live according to the principles and commandments in your word. <coughs> And above all, a people who are not afraid to open our mouths and proclaim your glory. Father, help us to do these things so that you might be proven right in all things and glorious in all things and worthy in all things, the just judge. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we pick up our story in Revelation this morning, uh, uh, what we found is that the Lord Jesus Christ is reaped from the earth all that remains, uh, 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 all those, those uh, saints that remained in the earth. And what has remained after his reaping are the unregenerate sinners, the ones who would not repent and believe that Jesus Christ is their only hope. And I understand what a wild sort of statement that sounds like, that that in one fell swoop, the Lord Jesus Christ can harvest all the people who believe in the world and leave the remainder of people in the world that are not harvested uh, to damnation. <clears throat> but that's the truth of Scripture. And it's laid out before us in the text. And it's not just something this preacher believes. It's, it's the Word of God. I believe that the church that we saw removed in the summary text in Revelation 11, 15 uh, has come in all of the power of its details uh, in 11, Revelation 12, uh, 13, and 14, and that culminates in that final reaping of Christ the King that we saw uh, in that text that we saw last week. And we again will not see the church now until Revelation chapter 19, which is in fact the marriage supper of the Lamb. And yes, the saints will be brought back to the earth to live under the rule of Christ the King for a millennium, which will be a foretaste of eternity to come. And yes, I know my saying that right now is going to open up in the minds of everyone more questions than we can answer this morning, and I even have worse news. That's just a trailer. We're not going to look at those questions this morning. That's yet to come. What is here for us today is something that is critical for every soul to know. And that critical thing is that there is salvation in no other name under heaven apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Savior, He is the King, He is the Lord, and He is the only one that brings hope. And as we see this story fulfilled in, in Revelation chapter 15 and chapter 16, chapter 17, what we will discover is that the day of pretending is over. The day of simply being religious and having the right book under your arm or having the right word in your mouth uh, is over. And the Lord Jesus Christ shared that truth with people while he walked on the earth. But they refused to hear him while he was with them. They refused to grasp what it was that he was sharing. But he shared eternal truths 
as he walked this earth. Turn with me for a moment, and this is an introduction, but turn with me to John chapter 10, verse 22. And John, of course, is the same writer uh, uh, writing the revelation that we're studying. But he records some words of Jesus in chapter 10, verse 22 and following that I think we need to see. He writes there, At that time the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem, and it was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. And so the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And listen to this, verse 28. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. And here's the kicker. I and the Father are one. Jesus was telling these people who asked him to tell them plainly, if you are the Christ, what did he say? I and the Father are one. I'm the Christ. But they didn't hear him. Now it's interesting because this is the first conversation that Jesus had with those same people. Turn back just a couple pages to John chapter 6, verse 35. Same truth, same group of people. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now here's a really interesting thing. And this is in keeping with the fact that I said that all the religions of the world are about to perish. The people to whom Jesus spoke these words were the most religious people that ever lived on the face of the earth, before then or until then or after then. And Jesus made this really clear when he spoke about them in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. In Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. <clears throat> Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And yet those same scribes and Pharisees rejected Jesus at every turn. Now according to the book of Acts, some of them did repent. And some of them became believers and some of them were influential in the start of the new church. But so many more were not. And so many of the Apostle Paul's letters were the stories of those same scribes and Pharisees hunting down and chasing Christian believers all over the known world to try and eliminate them, to try and interrupt their churches. 
And here's the sad state of affairs, is the spiritual progeny of those same scribes and Pharisees continue that effort until our own day. They continue to assist the accuser of the brethren in his unholy war until finally God will silence all of them. Now it might seem like a good thing for God to silence all of them, but when God gets to that point, it's not a good thing for anybody or for this world. Our text for the morning is Revelation chapter 15. And here again, John is painting a new scene in heaven. The the church has been removed, it's been gathered to Christ. And we will see the initial phase of the actual wrath of God poured out against those who are encamped around the holy city to make war on the saints and on the two witnesses. And what we studied last week in our text in chapter 14 is that the equivalent of the blood of 28 million human beings had already been crushed in that text by the winepress of God's wrath. And that is yet but a foretaste of what is to come for the unregenerate sinners in the world. God is going to continue to stomp and burn and devastate and inflict until there are no more of those who have consciously rejected him and left him. And once they are all gone, then the judgment. Revelation 15, 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. Ominous. For with them the wrath of God is finished. Now John's telling us here that this is a new scene in heaven. It's not a continuation of of what he just saw. It's it's something that he has used as a technique every time he enters a new section of this book. He says something along the lines of, then it was next, or then I saw, and then he goes into the next scene of, of the vision that God has given him. Now, what I want to tell you about the timetable of the visions that John is seeing is these are the timetable of his visions. Next I saw, next I saw, next I saw, but they're not necessarily the timetable of what God has been doing in the earth. And we've already seen that demonstrated as we've studied through this book. Now, the things that God is doing in the earth literally transcend time and space and go back to the time even before creation and to the culmination of the age. Uh, And so we are reading scenes in heaven that take into account the whole salvation history of God from end to end. But John is seeing the next vision, and so he describes it as such. Because he does that, a lot of people have interpreted this book to mean that this historically then must be the next action that happens in heaven. But we've already seen that there is recapitulation, in other words, retelling of the events that have already been told. And so in a sense, it's like when you watch one of these movies or series And one second you're dealing with adults and they're going through all their drama. And the next second you see kids playing by the creek and and a brother drowns or something and starts off the drama that will infect the family for a year. It's, it's, It's almost like that. Where in this story God tells us what is and then goes back and kind of shows us how we got there to what is. And so understanding that is a big key to understanding what it is that God has revealed to us in this book. And by the way, the very name of the book should uh, give us some clue. Um, I've, I've probably said this before, but this is the revelation of God given to bless those who are his. And in fact, in the very first chapter, he says those who read it and study it will be blessed. It's not something hidden It's not something that has to be figured out. It's not something that involves Gnostic understanding and numerology. God revealed to us what he wants us to see and know. And so therefore, it it must be open. And, And if our information about this book takes us in places where we have to delve into hidden resources that the Bible never mentions, then we're not seeing that God revealed it, but we're seeing maybe what the enemy would like to use to confuse us. So what does John see? 
He says, a great and, and amazing sign. Seven angels are all carrying seven plagues. That will be the end of sinful humanity once and for all. He notes that, that these are the last. Talking about the plagues, these, these are the last. For with them the wrath of God is finished. When God finishes this, he's, he's finished pouring out his wrath on the earth. Now he's not finished doing his work. We're going to see a lot more things that God does. In fact, he still has this devil to deal with, and he will. But this is when he pours out his wrath against the unrepented sinners of the world. Now, before we discover exactly what's going to transpire from the unleashing of those bold judgments of God, uh, John is going to show us another great event in front of the throne of God in the heavenly place. And he hearkens back to a picture that he shared with us in, cha in Revelation chapter 4. So if you want to turn back to Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, here's the first throne room scene, just a little part of it. John wrote, There around the throne were 24 thrones. Seated on the thrones were 24 <laughs> elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumbles and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are the four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. And in that scene, what were all these creatures and angels and elders all doing? Well, they were singing the praise of God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And, and that was their song that they sang and they sang and they sang and they sang. But now there is another scene in chapter 15 around the throne of God. And it's the same living creatures, it's the same 24 elders, it's the same angels, but there's a new presence involved. And who is this new presence? Well, they, these elders and creatures and angels are now joined by people redeemed from the earth. The saints of God, the church. And they join in singing these songs of praise to Almighty God. Look at Revelation 15, 2, in the first part of verse 3. <laughs> and I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, in other words, the saints, right, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And by the way, here's where this concept comes, that we're going to be like angels just playing harps in heaven forever. But this is one scene. One time, one scene. And they're newly in heaven. And rightfully around the throne of God, praising him with every ounce of their being. Amen? <coughs> but the songs have changed. No longer are they singing the same song that we saw in the first scene of the throne of God, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, but now they are singing the song of Moses, which told of the great work of the hand of God against the Egyptians who sought to hold his people captive. Now the song of Moses was the song that Moses wrote to glorify God for his great deliverance. And, and let's just look at a snippet of that. Exodus chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. And if your Bible is laid out where you have, you know, like songs and, and they're separated into lines like poetry, you'll see how long the song really is and we're not going to read it all. Exodus chapter 15, verse 1, Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. And that song goes on to exalt God the Most High for all that he did to bring his people from captivity and into the presence of his own person. 
and ultimately into the land that he promised his people as a, as a covenant promise. Look at Exodus 15, 11. The people still singing, Who is like you, O Lord among the gods, small g gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. Is there any more fitting a song to sing of God's people in the heavenlies? It's not an accident that Moses was given this song by the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Now these plagues that happened to Egypt are a foreshadowing in a manner of speaking of things yet to come. But I'm telling you, they were very real to the Egyptians that had to suffer. Yeah. Some of the Egyptians were spared. But none of the unrepentant sinners left in the earth after the wrath of God is poured out will be spared. The devastation will be total. The destruction will be complete. Only those who are in Christ will have a hope whatsoever of being guided by his strength into his heavenly abode. The text also tells us that they sang a song of the Lamb, Revelation 15, 3. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Now I want to tell you something that might not have sunk in until maybe this moment. But some of the ones that are singing those songs will be us. Amen? Amen. Yes. We will be before the throne of God singing these songs to his face. And if you don't understand worship, and if you don't know why we worship, then I'm begging you and pleading with you to fall on your face before Holy God and learn about worship. You know, when we sing now in our church, it is a rehearsal for our singing in heaven. Amen. And yet, so many in so many churches are turned off by the efforts of singing worship. <clears throat> All it takes is that they don't like the style, they, they don't care for the words, or they don't really particularly care for singing at all. And over the years, I've seen people even come to me and, and tell me, Pastor, worship is just a waste of time. Can we just get to the main thing and get done with the service so we can be on our way? God is sending us a revealed message in this text, not a hidden message. And the revealed message is that worship is why we exist. Do you hear what I'm saying? The reason we still evangelize is because there are still people who are not worshiping God. And he desires that our worship should come naturally, not contrived, not made up, because, you know, we got to do three songs before we get on to the rest of the service. We are created to worship him. And our worship should carry us directly to his throne. Oh, that God might break through us in the power of his spirit and have us fall all over this place in worship. You know, it's interesting in Psalm 22, which is a psalm of the cross of Christ. It literally has the actions of the cross foretold couple thousand years before Christ took that tree. And in verse 3, it says that God inhabits the praise of his people. And as that psalm continues, he explains because of the work of Christ on the cross, 
that the congregation someday will gather before his throne and worship him in person. And the ends of the earth will remember uh, to turn to the Lord and all the families and all the nations will worship him before his throne. I can't imagine that a psalm that is so directly talking about the crucifixion of Christ, all my bones are poured out like wax, turns at the very end of it to abject worship of God in the heavenly place. And it's after worship that the work of God begins. Revelation 15.5 Paul says, after this again, right? So he had said, after this, and we saw this interlude of worship, and he saw the angels coming out of the holy sanctuary. After this, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of the witness in heaven was open, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Now the sanctuary mentioned here it is the tabernacle of worship. It is the holy of holies that was in place in the part of that tabernacle that was constructed by the order of God. And it's interesting in the Old Testament when, when we see pictures of that temple and, and the holy of holies, what we see are priests that had to go out and specially consecrate themselves to make themselves holy to enter into that holy place one time a year uh, to atone for the people of God. But now we have the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, a high priest forever. And in fact, the writer of Hebrews told us about the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Hebrews 4.14 with me, if you would. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see, the writer's making sure we know who he's talking about here, right? Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence... Draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now John notes that the great sanctuary in heaven, the, the heavenly picture of what God had created on earth, is where these angels come carrying the wrath of God, the bowls of the wrath of God, and that sanctuary was filled with smoke. Well, we learn again from Revelation 5.8, just to, again that first throne scene uh, in heaven, uh, that the smoke represented the prayers of the saints of God. Look at Revelation 5.8 with me. And when he had taken the scroll, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So what's the tie-in? These angels are now carrying golden bowls of the wrath of God, and, and the sanctuary is filled with the smoke. Look at Revelation 6-9, I think we'll find the tie-in. When he, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of them who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. How long, O oh Lord? Until right now. 
until right now, the bowls of incense, the smoke, which is the prayers of the saints, those saints who dwelt under the altar of God, crying out to him, How long, O Lord, before you avenge us? And the Lord says, The time is right now. And there's no mistaking the pictures that are painted here for us. Again, God revealed to us the pictures that are being painted. It is time to be God and to hear their prayers and to answer their prayers. <coughs> the number of their fellow servants and brothers is complete, and God now prepares to unleash hell on earth. We're just going to start touching that this morning. Look at Revelation 16, 1 and 2. John writes, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And so the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Now there have been many through the ages that have tried to equate the ten plagues that were unleashed against the Egyptians with the plagues of Revelation, and there are in fact some similarities. But there's not an exact match, and, and the scholars have wondered why there's no exact match, because almost everything in Revelation uh, was foretold in the Old Testament by the prophets. Well, I think there is a match, but the match isn't in the exact details of the plagues, but in the fact that God sent plagues to do his work. And I think there's a match here in the fact that the seven bull plagues carried by the angels are intended to set the captives of God free from those who would hold them enslaved. And so God is about to war with these plagues against the unbelievers, the unregenerate, and against the beast and, and, the, and, and the great serpent who have been holding people enslaved to sin since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. How long, O Lord, until right now? Now, in the bulls of plagues against Egypt, they were systematically applied toward all the various gods that Egypt worshipped. And the same thing is true in these bowls of plagues that are unleashed in Revelation chapter 15, chapter 16, as they are applied toward the beast and, and, and toward the great serpent. Those who remained on the earth, who had bowed to worship the beast, now find themselves afflicted with sores upon their body. Now, you know, we might think, oh, yeah, I heard a little bit here and there. No, it's not like that. If you've ever had a, a nasty canker sore, you've never had one of those big boils that we now watch on YouTube videos, just imagine your entire body being covered with that kind of painful skin-eating sore. And what's worse, in the original Greek language, it says that these were malignant sores. These are not just painful things, they are cancerous sores on our body. Fun times. Revelation 16, 3. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse. And every living thing died that was in the sea. Now, what's different about the blood of a corpse over the blood of a living person? Have you ever seen the blood of a corpse? <clears throat> Well, the blood of a corpse is coagulating. It, it, it's, it's no longer alive. It's no longer warm and thin. It no longer brings life. It now brings death. And that is to be the whole ocean. One coagulated mess that cannot sustain life. And every living thing died that was in the sea. Now, what's one of the things that's different about the plagues in Revelation and the plagues that were visited on Egypt 
is in Egypt, God brought creatures into Egypt to torment them. In Revelation, he's removing all the creatures from the earth. Because this is the final stage of, of life on earth. Now, I just want you to consider how the world's oceans affect the ecosystem of our world. Without the life that is in the oceans, we will cease to exist as a planet. And, and many eco-zealots are, are alarmed about that, and rightly so, because the oceans produce the majority of our oxygen, not the jungles. It's the plankton in the ocean and all the things that feed on the, the ocean. Uh, I mean, literally, it, it, it handles every aspect of life on this world. The water cycle, the food supply, the ability to warm and cool the earth, it's all involved in the oceans. And God has now removed that. He sends a third angel, similar to the second, except for now he attacks the rest of the water on the planet. Revelation 16.4. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and on the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes. Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Now, I don't think the timing here is, is accidental. You see, because as the truth of these judgments begin to set in place in, in the mind of the reader, and you know, starting to understand, oh, wow, if this all happens, we have no hope of living in the world, right? And what's the thought that comes into the minds of people? What kind of God would do this? I mean, what kind of God would destroy the earth that he's created? <coughs> well, a just God who judges according to his word, who has promised from the beginning that he would destroy sin. And if the world is sinful, then the world will be destroyed. But I want to remind us of one simple fact, that he's also the creator. And what he destroys, he can make right again. And I do not believe for one second that the most apocalyptic verse in the whole of the Bible, which by the way is Genesis 1-1, will ever be stopped or thwarted or changed. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is his plan, and he'll not be stopped. So if he uncreates them, he will simply go back to Genesis 1-1 and recreate them. But when he recreates them, there will no longer be a shred of sin to inhabit those recreated worlds. Praise God, hallelujah indeed. He is a just and holy God. Now imagine the terror of those who have worshipped the creation instead of the creator. The utter fear of those who have promised that they can meet with God in the woods or on the lake, as well as in the church where God has commanded his people to meet. The, the eco-zealots that I've mentioned who place Mother Earth above all else, including above God, when God finally reaches out his holy hand and demonstrates to the entire world that he alone is the divine creator and divine sustainer of all things. And it's he alone that deserves all worship. Of course, those who are bent against God never will bend the knee toward God. The fourth angel comes, Revelation 16, 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. This, remember, I said was likely the same angel that had charge over fire that we saw in, in chapter 15 or 14. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. There are people now with cancerous sores all over their body, scorching heat, not a drop of water on the earth. The people are beginning to really suffer the consequences of their actions. 
It literally is now hell on earth. There is not one to come, as in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, to dip his finger in water and quench the lips. And the verse, vengeance is mine, I will repay, comes to mind. But do these people turn to God and beg Him for mercy? No. They curse the name of God, they do not repent, and they die. Now it's really interesting. Verse 9, they did not repent and give Him glory, reveals to us something about God. And I believe had they bent their knee and repented and given God glory that he would have relented on their behalf. But they didn't. And he can't. And he won't. Revelation 16.10 This is our final bit for this morning. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. God keeps sending angels. And just when the people think it can't get any worse, it gets worse. The people continue cursing God and dying. And there are more bold judgments, but we will save them for next Sunday, Lord willing, because they turn a corner. Because these people who are cursing God and dying are about to mount a last military campaign, and what they are about to mount is what we now know as the Battle of Armageddon. That's much more than we can handle with the time we have remaining this morning. For today, I think we've got plenty on our plates to consider. I mean, we really do. Just imagine what life might be like if God simply stopped granting new mercies every morning. If God simply said that his grace is no longer sufficient for us. The things that sustain us through whatever it is that comes to us, and Lord knows there's plenty coming to us, even as we walk with him, would become unbearable. And I want to say that there will be no human religion that will survive the days to come. There's going to be no boogie with the devil. There's going to be no Anton LaVey and his group of satanic worshipers doing anti-Jesus everything and in the glories of the party in heaven. It's, it's not going to be like that. These people are shown suffering and miserable. And the interesting thing is they cannot ultimately die. It's a horrific story. If we were to write some movie plot, we couldn't write it any more horrific than what we're being shown. And this is the truth of God. And again, he shares his truth, not so that we're terrified of the horrors to come, but so that we will turn and trust Jesus and be spared those horrors. Because the verse that says that those who believe in Christ will be spared from the wrath of God to come is true. The church was taken out before this wrath was poured out on the world. It's time now for us to repent about drawing away from God who is trying to draw us to him and save our souls. It's time to repent of us trying to have our way in everything and every day when there is only God's way. And it's time for those with true faith to call out to others to persevere until the end. And God has given up until this moment multiple opportunities for the people of the earth, including this clear revealed warning that we are studying in this last book of the Bible. And yet people still walk around saying, yeah, yeah, 
you Bible thumpers. Just a nice story that you've made up to keep your kids in line. No. It's God's story of redemption. It's our only hope. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father. Father, forgive me for preaching a word of doom and gloom, but you've given me the word to preach. And Father, I'll echo the thoughts of so many preachers of the past that if I could scare people out of hell, I would. But Father, I'm solely dependent on you, on the power of your Spirit to draw people into a right relationship with you, of the power of your Spirit to regenerate us and justify us and put us on the path to sanctification, to becoming holy as you are holy. And I pray now, Father, that those who have heard this message and have heard the word of damnation and doom to come might still, while there is a moment to draw breath, trust in your mercy made new every morning and trust in your all-sufficient grace to call upon your name and be saved. Father, the truth is I can't wait until we get to the end of the story. Oh, Lord, I can't wait till we get to the end of the story. Because after reading all this doom and gloom and contemplating it and preaching it and, and throwing it out there uh, at a world who may or may not be listening, I can't wait to see you in your glory and your saints who love you, worshiping you around the throne continually, and to see you restore life and restore glory and restore light and restore health and restore love. Oh, Lord Jesus, Maranatha, come quickly. We beg you. Amen and amen.